I'd like to ask you to give this video a thumbs up if you're a fan of Pawn Stars and subscribe to always be on top of our daily uploads. Also comment down below when you do so to enter our monthly shoutouts and we'll try to reply and thank as many of you as we possibly can. Pawn Stars, one of the biggest reality TV series, follows Rick Harrison and his family members as they run their gold and silver pawn shop on the Las Vegas Strip, haggling their way through life. As their lives revolve around estimating, purchasing and selling rare historical items, it would be right to consider them veterans of the business, especially because the family is in it for almost 30 years. Also, after 522 episodes over the last 9 years, it would also be easy to believe that the experienced guy from the pawn shop never make any errors or bad deals. Still, not even the best are error free, as not every deal is a good deal as success in business doesn't necessarily mean perfection. From bad decisions and stolen items, to blatant fakes, here are 10 times the Pawn Stars were scammed badly. In an episode aptly named Chum's Risky Business from season 15, a woman entered the pawn shop with boxes and boxes of old comic books she inherited from her uncle. All the comic books she doesn't know anything about were handed down to her and she was looking to sell them, certain there's something valuable in the pile. Judging by the prices on them, Chumley concluded they date from 70s or 80s, the period also known as the Bronze Age of Comics. Without asking for a second opinion, Chumley started haggling. The woman's initial asking price was $2,000, but Chumley immediately lowered it, taking into account the time needed to go through all of them and find the diamond in the rough. He offered her $50 per box, which summed up to $350, but they eventually struck a deal at $500, with Chum saying that life is about chances and sometimes you just gotta take him. Unfortunately, when an expert checked the comics out, it turned out that this wasn't the right chance to take, as he said that the comics would sell for about $200 if the Pawn Stars were lucky. If you spent $500 on some comic books, I'll be lucky to get like $180 out of, and seven boxes of the recyclable paper. Back in season 8, a studio musician called Vic Flick came to the Pawn Stars to sell a 1961 Fender Stratocaster. The guitar fascinated Rick from the get-go, as he recalled his early childhood memories of watching legendary Jimi Hendrix playing the iconic guitar. Apparently the guitar model had some history since Leo Fender, the inventor, came up with it in 1954, and it hasn't changed much throughout the years. Rick decided to follow his hunch and bought the guitar for $55,000. However, as Vic Flick, the owner of the guitar, is not really a legendary musician, most of the songs that had been recorded with this guitar were not exactly huge hits apart from the James Bond theme. Naturally, the guitar just started collecting dust in the pawn shop with a price tag of $90,000, so Rick eventually decided to sell it at an auction. Much to his despair, the guitar sold for merely $20,000, leaving him with a loss of $35k. Despite making great efforts to abide by state and local laws, the gold and silver pawn shop staff has, unknown to them, occasionally taken in stolen property, like every other pawn shop. In Season 7's episode called Shekel and Hyde, Rick bought a 2,000-year-old Tyrian shekel, a coin most historians believe was the mode of currency used in the infamous transaction of the 30 pieces of Judas, paid to Judas to betray Christ. It's a shekel of Tyre, like from the Bible. Um, yeah, we only buy American coins, man. A detective later came to the shop and informed them that the coin had been stolen, not by the seller who was featured in the episode, but by a previous owner of the coin. Nevertheless, the Harrisons were allowed to keep it as the original owner had been compensated by his insurance policy. But while they got lucky there, it turned out that Rick had paid way too much for the coin. Despite its rarity, a well-preserved shekel of tire would usually only be worth around $1,200 and, because it had been cleaned, this one had lost a lot of value, so most of the $1,600 that Rick had paid for the coin are probably lost forever. In the Season 6 episode Say It Ain't So, Rick made another ill-fated gamble without consulting his expert buddies when a seller came into the shop carrying a book that had supposedly been signed by baseball legend Shoeless Joe Jackson, since Joe Jackson's signature is one of the rarest ones to find. Throughout the appraisal, it seems that Rick followed his heart rather than his mind as he couldn't have been more excited. Because Jackson was illiterate, his signature is one among the most forged sports signatures in the world. Disregarding his own reservations and skepsis, as well as questionable certificate of authenticity, Rick eventually shelled out $13,000. It was only after spending all that money that he decided to pay his book expert Rebecca a visit. 
Rebecca informed him that the signature was most likely fake, so Rick went for a second opinion from an authenticator who backed Rebecca's claim, saying that the signature is not only a fake, but also a ridiculously bad one. Which means it's fake. <laughs> Great job, son. Back in 2012, a man by the name of John brought what he claimed was an authentic San Francisco Giants uniform worn by the legendary baseball player Willie Mays in 1961. Corey, who happened to be behind the counter, made a deal with the man for $31,000. The uniform included all the key details, the woolen flannel materials, a Spalding label, and the stitching of Mays' name, as well as his uniform number and measurements. However, one thing about the uniform seemed off, and even Chumley noticed it. It was in too good of a condition to be 50 years old, and to have been worn by Willie Mays who was known for sliding in the dirt every now and then. Even though the seller didn't provide a certificate of authenticity, Corey decided to go for it. The Harrisons eventually failed to resell it with a price tag of $80,000 in their shop, so it was auctioned off two years later for just about $19,000. As it turned out, the uniform was not only an almost $12,000 loss and had never been worn by Mays during a Giants game, it had never even been his uniform in the first place. In Corey's big play from Season 5, an elderly man came to the shop with a Wells Fargo strongbox from the 19th century. The strongbox contained two antique prison ball and chain sets that he believed originated from notorious human Folsom prisons. Rick immediately noticed that the chains have been electrically welded, which meant that they are fake, since the blacksmiths who forged the chains in the 19th century did not have electric welders. The balls that the man brought were fake as well, since they had names of the prisons on them, which wasn't the practice back in the day. The owner immediately got pretty defensive, but despite this and his own obvious doubts about the item's authenticity, he decided to buy the box for 450 bucks, probably hoping to make at least some profit. His plans came to a halt with the arrival of expert Mark the Beard of Knowledge Hall Patton, who called the box a complete piece of fantasy, and told Rick that it was one of the most faked items out there. You would think that by the time Season 4 was filmed, the Harrisons would have learned that Chumley should never, under any circumstances, be left alone and without supervision. Thank you. Even though more often than not he seems to be the scapegoat when something goes wrong at the shop, it is mostly well deserved. In one of the episodes from season 4, he was minding the shop all alone when a man walked into the shop carrying a vintage Gibson mandolin he picked up at a yard sale. He was hoping to make some money off of it so he could take his family on a trip to Ireland. With Rick and Corey out of reach, it was up to Chum to appraise the item. Encouraged by Rick drooling over another mandolin they had in the shop earlier, he decides to go above his purchase limit of $1,000 and seals a deal at $1,500. Even though the mandolin had the decals on the edges and the stamp of the modern script Gibson logo was visible through one of the F-holes, it turned out that it was one of the thousands of fakes that can be found across the US. Unfortunately for Chumley, who was worried about impressing Rick, he lost $1,400 since a friend and music shop owner later estimated the mandolin's worth at just 100 bucks. In the second season episode titled Helmet Head, a customer came in bringing a 1964 Austin Healey Sprite, a small British sports car designed to fit in bike sheds which originally cost about 1800 bucks. According to the owner, the car was generally in a very good condition and just needed some minor tuning up. Even though the car wouldn't start when Rick wanted to take it for a spin, he decided to make an offer since Austin Healey's are popular collector's items in the US. The owner wanted to sell it for $10,000, but Rick beat him down and eventually bought it for just half of that. It seemed like a good deal at the time, but when Rick took the car to his friend looking for a simple fix in order to resell it at a higher price, he got some rather bad news. Instead of the $300 or $400 tune-up that Rick had been hoping for, he came to know that it would cost him about $6,000 to fix the car, so one grand more than he had paid for it to begin with. Knowing that he had made a huge mistake, Rick obviously wasn't looking forward to telling the old man, and for a good reason. Although no money was lost yet, as Rick decided to just try to sell the Austin Healey in the condition it was in, the old man clearly was far from happy about the screw-up. The business instinct definitely runs in the family, but some things you have to learn the hard way, or at least Corey did. He basically grew up in the pawn shop as he was only 9 years old when he began working in polishing knobs. When he started working the night shift all by himself 9 years later, he picked some things up from his dad, but he wasn't really that experienced and simply didn't know what to expect. 
Apparently the word about a novice working at the shop got out and Corey ended up buying not one, but six fake Rolex watches in just one week. Even though this scam and his rookie mistake cost him 4,000 bucks, there's no doubt that he has learned his lesson. Some of the biggest scams that the older of the two pawn shop owners has suffered occurred back in the late 1970s and early 80s, when the so-called cubic zirconias or CZs first appeared in the markets. These clean-cut synthetic diamonds fooled innumerable pawn shops all across America, as they would appear to be 100% real when never tested at that time. The old man's shop suffered a loss of around $30,000 due to the fake diamonds, but he has learned his lesson. Nobody knew about them, and they tested as diamonds. Everybody in the industry bought a bunch of them, he said. Corey eventually did a DIY video about CZs and how to detect the fake diamonds, in which he said that the zirconias usually appear to be too perfect. As there are very few perfect diamonds out there, if you can find even the slightest hint of a scratch, they are most probably fake. Thank you very much for watching and don't forget to leave a thumbs up if you're a fan of Pawn Stars and subscribe to always stay on top of our daily uploads. Thank you again for watching and we'll see you next time.